Well, today's question is, can we devise a theory of human history? When you look at uh, the whole trajectory of big history, and I've seen a lot of it now, starting with the Big Bang and all the way down to, to human history, which is a very tiny part of big history in terms of, of length of time, then you notice that all these different aspects of big history all have their paradigms. We have Big Bang cosmology, we know how stars and galaxies formed, we know how the solar system formed, we have plate tectonics as a general theory for geology on, on the planet. We don't have a theory of the biosphere, and then we come to human history and there's nothing. Why is that? I think the reason is that uh, humans have been studying themselves with so much focus and so much interest and so much detail that they have never really taken the opportunity to step back and look at us from a perspective that we're looking at now, that uh, living on the surface of a planet surrounded by a big, empty, dark universe. And that's what we need to think of ourselves now, because we've seen that picture and we're aware of it, and it matters, as you've seen. So how can we perhaps start to devise a theory of human history that does justice to all these aspects? Well, let's first start with is a general problem in social science. People tend to look at, at other people as individuals, and that's all we are. We are all different. Nobody's exactly the same. And we all live in societies. And what are societies? Uh, sociologists study societies. Psychologists study individuals who interact with each other. And apparently something in there is what makes individuals into societies. So how can you conceptualize that? Is there a contradiction? Can we actually devise a theory of individuals and society? I think that this sociologist, this German sociologist Norbert Elias, who lived between 1897 and 1990, uh, has come up with an important part of the answer. Here you see him when he turned 90, when he was at a conference at the Free University and was able to give a speech, 45 minutes, very coherent, very lucid, while he was turning blind. And he couldn't hear very well anymore. But he was able to do that. It was an extraordinary man, it was an extraordinary vision. And this was his vision. He says that basically we have to look at humans connected to each other by networks of interdependencies, which he called figurations. And these figurations change over time. So you have to look at them as processes, as processes of change and some continuity. And as a result, you can look at human relations as balances of power and interdependency, just like we have a relationship right now, even through our online course. You can think about these interdependencies, perhaps. But then you want to know what is power? What is the power that actually we have over you? Well, we can deny you a certificate at the end of the course. That is our power. And your power over us is that you decide either to join in or to do something else. So that is part of our interdependency. If we have a continuing interdependency, then you will keep following the course and you'll get your certificate if you do it well. And if you decide to take distance, well, that's the end for both of us in a way. And sometimes you have to do things that you may not really like to do. But you have to do it in order to achieve your goal. And that is where the concept of power comes in, according to another German sociologist, Max Weber. He says it's the probability that someone can impose his or her will against resistance. So you may not want to take all the course uh, modules, but if you do that, you won't get a certificate. So our power base is basically the latter thing. And if you like everything, of course, that's great. If you don't like everything, but most of it, that's also great. But then still you have to do certain things, and that's where the power balances play a role. Now, Norbert Elias uh, investigated that by looking at different standards of conduct from the Middle Ages into early modern times. 
He looked at how the knights of the Middle Ages were behaving among each other. These were quite often rough guys who had rough eating habits and they had to fight. So they had to fight, they had to compete, so they had to be rough in a way, simply because otherwise they wouldn't survive. And then when larger units formed, either through conquest or through alliances, then slowly but surely you got more powerful individuals at the center who had a whole string of people around them who had been vanquished and became actually their uh, subordinates. So that's how courts formed according to Elias, that the winner turned into kings and that the, the guys who lost turned into courtiers. Of course at a court you cannot really fight anymore, at least not with swords. So what you see is that people, instead of fighting with sword, they started more and more fighting with good behavior, refined behavior. And that's how you see all these habit change, according to Elias. So basically he looked at the court society as evolving out of uh, earlier uh, societies consisting of knights with the separate uh, little uh, units, turning into bigger unit the state, and as a result, the standards of conduct changed as a result of changes in the balance of power and dependency. That was his major thesis. And I think that makes a lot of sense. You have to realize, of course, that not all people behave according to the standards that are there, but at least their behavior is measured according to the standards that are there. And that is what's important, that you have to look at both the real behavior, the actual behavior, and the expected behavior. There's another point that I think is important in his theory, that is his concept of external constraint, that basically people try to force someone else to behave a certain way, and self-constraint, that basically you force yourself to do that. And he says there's a balance between it, and that happens among other things during... Uh, education, when kids grow up and become adults, and that's what parents do a lot. You have to exercise constraint to make sure that kids do what they want to do, but at a certain point they internalize it and then they sort of regulate themselves. At least that's what you hope will happen. And there's always a balance, he says, and there's a lot more that can be said about it, but this is a fundamental point that is part of his theory of interdependencies and that links psychology with social relationships. I used his theory for my research in, in Peru when I looked into religion and uh, power in an Andean village. Here you see a picture from that Andean village, the village of Zurite in Antapampa, not far from, uh, from Cusco, the ancient Incan capital. And I realized uh, that, let's say, looking at religion, you could look at it as a separate set of interdependencies, different from, let's say, the civic order or family relationships. So you can think of all these different sets of interdependencies that exist and you call them regimes. At that time the term regime was being developed not only by me, I basically picked it up from uh, others who were doing that, but I developed it according to my own ideas to some extent because I realized that within these regimes there are always people wanting to do something and are people forcing other people to do something. So any regime consists of, of both basically a balance of needs of people who want to do something and constraints people forcing others to do something. And that's what you're seeing here. You see an improvised uh, procession for the patron saint, San Nicolas de Vary, the, basically the local version of the Dutch uh, Saint Nicholas. Uh, it was totally improvised and it was such a surprise that actually the parish priest didn't know it was going to happen. Here you see the parish priest, uh, Manuel Bravo, standing there. And he told me later, I had no idea that it was going to happen. So why did that happen? Why did people suddenly take the initiative to celebrate this patron saint that had been forgotten for many, many years? And why was he forgotten? And what happened a few years later? And suddenly you see the whole procession is formalized. It's a big band. Everybody's dressed up, the whole procession suddenly has taken a more formal, regular shape. So what happened there? What were the interests involved? What were the changes of dependency and power that made that possible? 
that was just a tiny little part of my research, but a fascinating one. And I think that Eliza's theory helped me to analyze this much better than I could otherwise have done. And I think that his theory is very, very helpful for analyzing human history as a whole. But there's more to it than that. What Elias not paid a lot of attention to was cultural learning. How did people learn over time, both individually and as societies? And that's where cultural anthropology comes in. It's a long tradition of cultural learning. And the person who explained that to me the most clearly was an anthropologist from the United States, uh, Marvin Harris, who you see here in Amsterdam while he was visiting us. He explained it very well in his textbook, uh, Culture, People, Nature. Actually, this book convinced me that it was a good idea to uh, study cultural anthropology, which I did subsequently. So here you see us discussing this. This was part of my uh, PhD uh, study. And you see my supervisor, Joop Goudsplom, and other PhD students at the same table. So we involved in a learning process here. And it was Marvin Harris explaining to us how that worked, why it was important and how it worked according to his vision. So we need to combine this with the ideas of Elias. And there are two scholars who have already tried to do that. That is William McNeil, the great world historian, and his son John McNeil, who's also a great uh, world historian. Um, they, William McNeil started visiting Amsterdam in the early 1980s and as a result became acquainted with the work of Norbert Elias. Before that time, his emphasis had been on skills, the importance of skills in human history, the idea that in a certain period people had superior skills and as a result they could advance more than others. But these skills tend to shift across the world and that was his general model. So it is in a way a model of cultural learning. So when they became aware of Norbert Elias's ideas, they tried to combine that idea of skills with the idea of interdependencies, and the result was a book called The Human Web, where they provided their synthesis. I think it's an admirable piece of work, but I also think it's not the end of the story. I think we still left with, let's say, important pieces of the puzzle solved, but quite a few still left, and I'll show you what I think needs to be done. First of all, we need to more systematically combine these human interdependencies as an idea with cultural learning and skills. That's what needs to do. Not only learning, but also forgetting, because people forget. And what's happening? We tend to look at what emerges. We tend to sort of forget to look at what disappears most of the time. But if you think about human history, you have to look at both. We have to think about all the other capabilities that humans have, emotional, cognitive, whatever. What are we? And all of that, as long as it is expressed in forms of behavior, should be part of a general theory of human history. We also have to think about our interdependencies with the rest of nature. We are interdependent on the rest of nature, but there's no model yet that incorporates that. And then we have to think about our ceaseless struggle against the second law of thermodynamics that basically tells us we need to keep using matter and energy to keep our complexity going. Also, that has not yet been incorporated in, uh, into a general model. So here's the puzzle. Here are the pieces. Or perhaps there are more pieces that I don't see that may be missing. So please help us. We need your help.